Okay, welcome to uh, note set 20, where we'll be covering the last section. I think it's the last section in, in chapter 4, section 4.3, where we will talk about least squares approximations. Um, now, you've probably uh, seen uh, something with least squares. Uh, probably in high school, you were introduced to the idea of fitting a line to some data points maybe in your physics class or something like that, or maybe in a, a statistics class that you may have taken as an elective in high school. <clears throat> and you may have seen uh, least squares if you've taken a probability and statistics class uh, at the college level, which uh, ECEs uh, are required to do that. So uh, if you've taken that already, then you've seen that. But no doubt you've heard about fitting a line to some data. Uh, and that's least squares, but that's really only one special. There we are. There it is. I should have been waiting for it. Uh, that's only one special case of a much bigger idea. And in fact, if you've ever ridden on an airplane, and I'm betting that you have, um, you have benefited from the concept of least squares. Um, it really is ubiquitous in electrical and computer engineering um, for um, developing uh, ways of tracking things, ways of estimating um, parameters of data that you've collected, or even in real time, you um, make some measurements and you'd like to learn something in real time about some system. So, uh, you know, think about all the, all the excitement today about automatic driving cars. Um, that these cars have to be constantly measuring um, things about themselves and things about the environment around them. Uh, and what that means is that uh, they're collecting things through sensors and can't make those measurements perfectly. And so the things that those measurements are intended to tell them about the environment around them, including uh, their own system, uh, are, are imperfect, and, and so uh, we have to have some way of solving that, and that's where least squares comes into this. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll cycle back to this idea <clears throat> at the end of the, the lecture um, after you've got a little bit of the theory under your belt. Now, just a warning, this, this is a longer video than, than the others, um, just because it's a big topic, and I really couldn't see splitting it into two just for the sake of splitting it into two. Um, it's all connected, uh, so just you got to sit down and, and go through it. Um, I'm estimating it'll be a little bit over an hour, um, uh, less if I just shut up and get moving. All right, I'll do that. Um, so let's motivate least squares. Um, what is it that we're trying to do here? Well, uh, a lot of engineering problems, we get a, a system of equations to solve, ax equal to b, and the matrix A is square and full rank. And so we've already seen that in that case, B cannot, <laughs> cannot be outside of the column space of A. There just is no way for it to be there because the column space of A is the full space. So any B um, will result in a solution. And in principle, you just find the inverse of A, which will exist because it's square and full rank, um, and use that to pre-multiply B and you get your X. So this kind of problem, uh, if, if you've taken your circuits class already, uh, this kind of problem shows up when you write your uh, loop equations or your uh, nodal equations or mesh equations. Um, any of those things, you'll, you'll end up with a, um, a series of linear equations. And if you put them into matrix form, you'll end up with a square full rank matrix that you can solve. So lots of other problems end up like that, too, in engineering. Um, and, uh, and we know how to solve those. Um, but there's many engineering settings where, for whatever reason, and we'll, we'll allude to this some more later um, as to why this happens in, in just a little bit. We'll, we'll, we'll let you in on the secret. But a lot of times we get a, a tall matrix that is full rank, um, and uh, so that means we have more equations uh, than unknowns. And uh, this is what's known as an overdetermined system of equations. If we have fewer equations than unknowns, we would call it an underdetermined 
And uh, well, I've never heard anybody use that terminology for the square uh, case. If the other one's over and one is under, what's the one in between? I guess just like determined. Um, but nobody says that. I uh, never really thought about that until just now. Anyway, lots of times we end up with a tall matrix. Um, and uh, with, with, but it has to have full rank. So we as engineers need to design the system from which we're getting the A so that it is full rank. Um, why it ends up being tall, we'll talk about in just a, a few minutes. Um, so we know, we've seen already that when we've got a tall matrix, even not full rank, but, but um, full rank, not full rank, doesn't really matter. The important thing is a tall matrix um, there's only a solution for certain B, and uh, that certain B um, uh, have to, you know, any B that lies in the column space of A will give us a solution. Now, because of the, so that's because of the tallness. So the tallness gives us that only a, a solution for certain B. Um, couple that with the full rank part, and we know that that solution, if there is one, will be a unique solution. Now the problem is that in these engineering settings we often don't have a B that gives us a solution. Um, and so now we're in a situation where there is no solution to the equation and uh, you know one might say then maybe we've got the wrong equation, um, but that's not really the, 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 um, the case. Uh, the case is that this is the best that we can do, and we'll see why we're doing it this way, why we're forced into this scenario in just a little bit. Um, in fact, maybe even on the next slide, if I remember right. Um, but the idea is that since we don't have a solution, what are we going to do? Um, that's, that's the key. So let's uh, take a look at this slide. Um, so here we're, we're talking about uh, re remembering a slide that we saw before. Um, so here we are just showing the slide for a tall matrix. So we've got our AX equal to B, and I just put this in here. Uh, we, we've seen this slide before, although we didn't have this, this, this blue box around it. This is our place of interest right now. So for right now, because we're limiting ourselves to tall and full rank, None of this stuff over here is of interest to us right now, but I, I left it there so you could see for contrast. Um, but when we have a full rank tall matrix, so we are explicitly dealing with the tall matrix, um, if B lies in the column space, then we have one solution. So that's the unique solution scenario. If B does not lie in the column space, then we have no solution. Now, the reason we don't really want to end up over here is that we don't want to have a system where there's infinitely many solutions in this setting. So, you know, suppose we were trying to measure a bunch of uh, parameters or a bunch of things about our environment in a, in a, a self-driving car. Uh, we want to find out, you know, what is the, um, what are all the parameters within our car? So, you know, how fast am I going? In what direction? Uh, what kinds of forces are there? Um, sideways on the car, downward on the car. We want to measure all of that so that we know what the total dynamic environment our car is in. How is it moving? Is it rolling over right now? <laughs> um, is it spinning around, uh, you know, as if in a skid? Um, what is it doing? Um, what's the speed of the engine? Uh, what's the uh, scenario or what's the state of the brakes? Are they on full, halfway on? Um, are the wheels locked and, and slipping? We want to know all that. So we need tons and tons of sensors in there. Um, plus we need sensors about the external world. Um, where are the obstacles? Are they stationary obstacles? Are they moving obstacles? Um, where is the road? Um, where am I in terms of geolocation, uh, you know, GPS, um, uh, that kind of thing. Nope, just ignore that phone. Hopefully uh, somebody downstairs will pick that up in just a minute, or maybe not. Uh, I forgot to unplug the, the phone up in the room where I'm recording this. Uh, yes, we're striving for professionality in these videos. Ha! No, what I'm striving for is to... is. <laughs> 
quality conveyance of, of knowledge, um, and I'm not letting the tiny distractions get in the way. Anyway, so um, we've got all these sensors, and suppose we're in this situation over here on the right. From those measurements of the sensors, um, there would be infinitely many solutions to try to figure out um, you know, the state of our car. Well, <laughs> there should only be one state of the car, um, not infinitely many different possible states. Uh, it would be horrible if we took all these measurements uh, with sensors that are not measuring these things directly, per se. So it's not like we're necessarily measuring our speed and positions and you know all that with one sensor for each thing we want to know. Um, we're, we could be measuring these things indirectly through other types of sensors. Um, and so we would only want there to be one solution, not infinitely many solutions. So that's why when we design our sen sensor system, we need to make sure that the A, which we call our observation matrix, because we're using A to observe X, X holds the values of all the things that we really want to know. So X it contains the value of our speed, our um, you know rotational uh, state, uh, you know any anything, the speed of our engine, um, the temperature of our tires, anything that we want, um, and we're measuring it through some system that can be modeled as we're get, taking some matrix A times those numbers if we had them and giving us a vector B. So these are the actual numbers we see. So given B, the things that we observe, and knowing A, something about how we designed our sensor system, our job is to determine X. We don't want there to be infinitely many solutions. We want there to be one solution. So we would desperately want our B to be in that space. And if this is truly how it's working, there are some numbers here. Our system measures those. We should get a B that lies in the column space of A. Um, and so there should be one solution. So what goes wrong? How do we end up over here? Well, good question. How do we end up in a scenario with no solution whatsoever? Um, so as I said, X holds the values of things we want to measure about some system. Um, in this case, it could be the self-driving car. Um, and we want to know um, its, its current state, so to speak, um, and we use, we design a sensor system, and we want to take a lot of measurements. That's how we end up in the tall um, case. The more measurements we can take, um, the better off we're going to be. Uh, if, if we're only going to take, if we only say have 10 things that we want to really know about, uh, we might want to take 20 or 100 measurements about it, partly because then there's some redundancy built in, but we'll also see that it helps us combat noise. And that really is the culprit here. So if we could measure perfectly without any measurement errors, we'd be all set. We would know our A, we would have designed our sensor system so that it's a tall, full rank matrix. Um, we would have this be true, which we have perfectly observed. And we could solve for x. There's a, a way to do that, it's, um, and we've talked about that. We can't invert a because it's, it's tall, but um, there is a way to solve this problem. But here's the crux. Here's the problem. Our measurements are not perfect. Every measurement you take, you've learned about this in your physics classes and maybe in some of your lab classes, that when you, when you take a measurement, there is an error in it. It might be small, but it's often enough to cause a problem. So we don't see B true. We don't actually observe this. We observe it with some error vector that's due to errors in our sensors. There's always noise in our electronics. When you turn on your stereo, don't put any CD on, turn the volume up, you'll hear a hiss. That's the inherent noise in an electronic system. So no matter how good you are at designing your system. You can make it low noise, but you can never make it no noise. 
So the actual B that we get is not the true one. So we don't have that. What we have is AX is equal to B observed. Now you might say, okay, so you know, how likely is it that this noise vector moved us out of this being in the column space? Maybe this is still in the column space. Well, I will tell you that although it's possible, the probability of that happening is very, very small. So almost always, virtually every single time, your observed um, vector will not be in the column space of A. Um, so we've got no solution. So what are we going to do? And, and this is what I would refer to as the curse of noise. A big part of what electrical and computer engineers do is figure out ways to combat the curse of noise. Why are you not getting good uh, signal on your, uh, you know, why aren't you able to, to get a, a, a cell phone call far from the, the cell phone station, uh, the cell phone base station? Well, the signal keeps getting weaker and weaker, but the noise inside your handset doesn't change. So once that signal coming in gets so weak that compared to the noise, um, we can no longer combat the noise, you lose your call. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the ongoing struggle within so many areas of electrical and computer engineering. So here's a picture. We've got our full rank tall matrix A. It's going to take some observation over here. I didn't show the dot for it. It's going to take some observation over there. And if we had perfect sensors, would give us this, this dot here. And having observed this dot, we could then figure out what dot it came from. That's the idea. But the problem is that because of the curse of noise, what we really observe is something here, which is outside of the column space. So now it looks like we're screwed. What are we going to do? Well, that's where least squares comes in. And I'm going to motivate the idea from something that you've probably seen, fitting a line to data. So we'll see how this uh, comes about from that setting. We'll see why we need lots of data points um, to make things better. Um, same thing for our self-driving car, um, and we'll see um, the effect of our measurement noise. Now, the, the, the measurement noise that I'm going to be drawing here so that you can see it will be quite large. Um, and, uh, you know, that may be larger than what you have in a, in a real-world scenario um, uh, where, where you're trying to get very accurate measurements. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the idea. So here's another illustration of how we might use these ideas as electrical and computer engineers. So suppose we've developed some new device, and what this device does is you apply a voltage to it, and it creates a frequency. So, you know, you could think that this is, um, you know, sort of like an electric piano in a sense. You push a one key, it applies a voltage to this oscillator, and that voltage will give you a certain frequency. And you might play that oscillating sinusoid, um, and, and it would have a certain pitch. Um, but this could also be used in a, a larger electronic system to allow a computer to generate a voltage that would control the frequency of some oscillator that you could use to tune a radio. So, you know, in your car, when you push a button to scan through the, the stations, this is kind of what's going on. So you've developed a new device, suppose. Suppose you've developed this new device um, and you have a hypothesized rule based upon the physics of how you develop the rule that says you think that um, one variable, voltage, is related to the other variable, frequency f, through this rule. And maybe you don't know exactly what alpha and beta are, but you, f you know that this is the rule that you think is going to um, uh, characterize this new device. So alpha and beta are fixed, but unknown for right now. And maybe they vary slightly for each particular device you build. As you change the voltage V, um, you'll get a different frequency. And you can see this is the equation of a straight line. Beta is the intercept. Alpha is the slope. So we have this kind of hypothesized linear relationship between V and F. Um, but we don't know what alpha and beta are, or maybe we have an idea, 
and we're trying to hypothesize and prove experimentally that our theory that says what alpha and beta are seems to be correct. So what do we do? We go ex into an experiment. Um, we're going to experimentally apply various voltages, and we'll assume that we know those voltages absolutely perfectly. Now, in reality, there's going to be some errors in, in those voltages as well, but for right now, uh, in this course, we'll assume that um, the, 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 the controllable variable here, in this case V, um, is, controllably, is controlled perfectly. Um, so, but then we have to measure the resulting frequency, and we're going to uh, suppose that that can only be measured approximately. So, you know, we put it on an oscilloscope, maybe we count some squares uh, along the horizontal axis and figure out what the, what the period of that sinusoid is and figure out what its frequency is. Um, so there's a, 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 an error-prone measurement of what the frequency is. And suppose we get these six dots as our measurements, so for a bunch of different voltages. So, um, you know, suppose these are the different voltages that we have here. Um, so, um, we look at those and we say, hmm, if we didn't account for noise uh, in our measurements, we might say, gee, this doesn't look like a line at all. Um, they seem to be going all over. Um, so the blue line is the true function, which we don't know at this point. The dots are the noisy measurements, and the vertical dashed lines show the errors that were made when we made the measurements. And like I said, these are you know big errors. Uh, you might not actually have such big errors if you were to really do something like this, but you'd still want to apply um, the, the least squares ideas here. So the the, the point is, pun intended, no line goes through the points. So there is no solution to find the line that matches these points. So what do we do? Well, like you learned in high school and maybe in your physics class in college and maybe in your statistics and probability class in college, fit the best line. So quote unquote fit, quote unquote best. What do we mean by fitting the best line? Well, find the line such that if we were to take the squares of all these errors, so the distance that the dot is away vertically from the line, take those distances, square them, add them all up, we want to make that thing as small as possible. Now, that, that is kind of a nice, you know, fuzzy, warm feeling that we can do that or that that would be a good thing to try to do. Clearly, if we can make those uh, sums of squares of errors small, that would um, convince us that this is some sort of a, a good um, fit of a line to that. So that's what we want to do. And this is this sum of squared error is why we call this idea least squares. So how does all this relate to solving some matrix equation AX equal to B where A is a tall matrix? Well, let me also say, suppose, um, I missed my V6 here. There should be a, a, a V6 here, which I just missed. Um, suppose, um, I mean, we can see that the more data that we collect, the better we would be, right? Suppose we only took F1 and F2, and I, I put tildes on these to, to, to indicate that these are not the true F that would come from this actual model, but they are measurements. So I, I'm using the tilde to distinguish something that was measured versus something coming from just plugging a V value into that actual line equation. Okay, so suppose I only took two measurements. Suppose I took one and two. I fit my line. It can fit through those perfectly. Suppose I even just take F, uh, you know, one, two, and four. Now it can fit through. Uh, it looks like I could possibly fit through um, all of those. But suppose maybe instead I took only two measurements that were, let me clear this off, um, one and five. Now I'm going to be fitting a line that looks like that. So clearly, just taking two data points at a time doesn't really help. And I think it's pretty clear that the more data points I have, um, the better my fit of my line will end up. Um, certainly fitting two could give me a bad line. Fitting 
to three um, might help out a little bit. Four is going to help. Five, six. If I were to take 20 measurements here, um, maybe within the same range, let's just limit it. I, I'm not going to go any further than uh, to the right than where my sixth measurement is. I just take a bunch more measurements in here. Um, it's going to help me nail down better what kind of line will actually fit. This is along the lines of suppose suppose you step on your scale in the morning to measure how much you weigh. You step on once and you observe. Well, okay, that was an estimate, a noisy measurement of your weight. So you step off, you step back on, gives a slightly different measurement. Step off, step on, another measurement. Now, if, if you were like me, I would maybe do that 20 times and take the smallest one and say, that's the, my weight. Um, but what you really ought to do is probably add them all up and divide by how many you made. And the, the more you add up and divide by a larger number, the more accurately you are um, you know, kind of combating the effect of the measurement noise. Same idea here. All right, let's see how this gets us to AX equal to B. So for every V value, so I take V1, and I imagine plugging that in here. So what I'm saying is I'm trying to find something where this right-hand side with my actual V values that I picked matches my measurements here. So I plug in my V1 here, and I say I'm looking for an alpha and beta that will give me my actual observed number. So if that's the only measurement I take, well, there's many alphas and betas that will give me that measurement. Um, so that doesn't help. And I say, well, there's two unknowns, so I should take another measurement. Now I take V2. I plug that in. I still don't know what alpha and beta is. So on the right hand, or left-hand side, I just write down my known V2 that I, that I set. I write down the symbols alpha and beta, and on the right-hand side, I write down the actual numbers. So these are the actual numbers that I measured, okay? Now I got two points. Clearly, I can fit a perfect straight line through them. So that's not what I want, but I keep doing that. I keep taking measurements, measurements, and measurements, and I, on my nth measurement, I plug in my nth voltage, something out here perhaps, uh, you know, or V6 if I only have six of them. I leave my alpha and beta as unknowns that I want to try to find. I plug in the actual number. So these are all numbers that go in on the right-hand side. These are all numbers that go in here for the Vs. Um, and so now I have N linear equations, and there is no one line that goes through all of those. Um, so... We can't find the solution to this. Um, so there's no solution. But now we can see how this relates to the AX equal to B by doing this. So notice, let me clear some of this ink off here. Um, what I've done is I've got a, a vector with alpha and beta. So notice that the alpha needs to multiply by a string of the Vs. So in my first column, I of my matrix, I put the Vs, and notice that bal uh, bal <laughs> balpha, beta <laughs> just multiplies essentially times 1 each time. So I put a string of 1s down there. And then in this column, I put the string of my observations. So here are the actual voltages that I picked. So 0, maybe 1 volt, 2 volts, 3 volts, whatever I want, whatever I think is appropriate. I put those in there. I know those. And remember, we're assuming that those were um, available perfectly. So if I set my supply to 5 volts, it's giving me exactly 5 volts. I know these from my understanding of what I'm really trying to model over here. I don't know these things. I'm trying to determine those. And I plug in my actual measurements. And because of the noise, since they don't all lie on a straight line, this does not lie in the column space. So the fact that there's no solution to these means that this is not in the column space. And I think you can see that. So no solution. So notice how we went from a line, fitting a line to some data, 
to a nice tall matrix problem to solve and there was no solution because our measurements were noisy. Also note that um, we, we already argued why we need so many measurements even though there's only two things that we're trying to decide. Remember, if we took two measurements thinking, well, I've only got two things I'm trying to learn about, so I might as well just take two measurements, I, I'll fit a straight line that will be very, very wrong. So going back to our self-driving car, if there's 10 things I want to know about my car, I probably don't want to just take 10 measurements. I'm going to want to take, you know, 100 measurements maybe. And here we're doing this over a bunch of different voltages, but in the car, um, each sensor will contribute to one of these observations. So instead of having um, something varying with different voltages, we'll have um, different sensors providing us different observations. Um, so it's a little bit different, but um, kind of related. So the point is, is that for the familiar fitting a line, you end up with an AX equal to B. And so now we can generalize that and say, anytime I can set up uh, a tall AX equal to B, where the B ends up being contaminated by noise, th that will be just a least squares problem that I can solve using the ideas that we develop here. So what do we do? We've got our B observed because of measurement noise not being in the column space of A, so we've got no solution, what are we going to do? Um, and so here's the idea. Here's what underlies the least squares. So um, unlike in your earlier class where all you had to do was jot down on a sheet of paper um, and uh, be able to regurgitate that formula, um, I would encourage you as you go through your engineering studies to stop attacking courses that way. Try to understand the rationale and the big idea underneath it. Um, the rest will just take care of itself, but you'll become an excellent engineer. You'll become extremely employable, and you'll become someone who an employer wants to keep around. Um, so you'll remain employed. All good things. Um, so it's not just about being able to solve for, you know, some numerical answer. you got to know why you're doing it, and more importantly, what's the big idea behind it? Because then when someone comes to you and says, do you think we could make a self-driving car? There's not going to be a formula that you're going to pull out and say, yeah, the formula says, yes, we can build a self-driving car. You're going to say, hmm, I bet there's going to be a lot of least squares involved in that. And I kind of know the understanding. We're going to have to take a lot of measurements. So we'll need a lot of sensors. Um, you'll know how to think through the problem and get to where you need to go. So what are we going to do? Here's our observed dot. It's been perturbed from our true dot through some noise vector that took us out there. What are we going to do? We're going to project. What we want to do is find the closest B, the closest thing to our observed. We, we have no idea where this is. If we did, we'd be set. We know where this is. We know where the column space is. We want to find the closest thing that's in the column space closest to the actual observed. And if there is, once we do find that, then we can find one unique X that would take us there. And the, the hope is that that will also be close to the true, that this will be close to the B true, and this will be close to the X true. Um, how close? Well, uh, that'll depend uh, on how the system is set up and um, characteristics of the A matrix and characteristics of the amount of noise. Uh, we won't get into that in this course, but there are other courses later, uh, particularly at the graduate level in electrical and computer engineering, where um, you can learn about that stuff. Um, and it's a course called Estimation Theory, and hey, guess what? <laughs> I, I teach it. That's the course that uh, I enjoy teaching uh, the most at the graduate level. Um, so uh, if you go to grad school here, check it out. Anyway, that leads us to this idea of a projection. So what we need to do is take our observed B, project it onto the column space of A, and then 
we can solve it. Ax equal to b has no solution, but we've already talked about how if we take and multiply from the left by a transpose, then we get the so-called normal equations, and we can solve that. We can find the x hat, and the x hat will actually be the, the thing that will map into the projection over here. Um, so in, in the previous section on projections, we were all about the P. What's the P? We're thinking about the, the projection over here. What does that look like? Now we're going to be all about what's the solution X hat to that? What's the, what's the X hat that goes into the projection through A? Um, and that turns out to be the least square solution. So if you can keep this idea in your mind, you're on your way to being a great engineer. Let's look at an example for this simple line fitting case. So here's three points. We're saying we'd like to suppose they are noisy measurements from, a, from some model of a straight line. C plus DT. So T is our variable that we are um, able to perfectly control y is the thing that we're measuring with some error. Um, and we, we took some measurements, t equal to 0, y equal to 6, t equal to 1, y equal to 0, t equal to 2, y equal to 0. Um, and if you look at those points, there's no line that goes through them. So I think there's, is there a picture here? No, I didn't put a picture here. Um, but if you plot those out, you'll see there, <laughs> there's no chance there's a line going through those three points. Um, we write it in matrix form, and remember we talked about how to put the values from your measurements into, into the matrix. So we know what goes into X. Um, X is filled with the two things we're trying to find, the slope and the intercept, the system parameters, the things about the self-driving car that we'd like to know. Um, in this example are the C and the D. You know, the self-driving car is probably not trying to fit a straight line to something. Well, maybe it might. Trying to figure out <laughs> straight line to where it needs to go, maybe. I don't know. Um, but X holds those unknowns. What about the rest? Well, the B vector contains our observations. 6, 0, and 0. Those are the things that we measured and are noisy. So they go into the B vector right there. And then... What else goes in? Our A matrix goes in with, well, C is the, is the intercept, so now our column of ones goes in front. It's not going to make any difference. Um, it's because we're putting intercept first and slope second, whereas in the previous page we had slope first and intercept second. So the column corresponding to the intercept is all ones. The column corresponding to the slope is the values at which we're evaluating these measurements. So the t values, so 0, 1, and 2 uh, in this case. They don't have to be integers. They don't have to be equally spaced. They can be whatever you want, whatever you happen to measurement, uh, to measurement, whatever you happen to measure. Although there are, as we said, reasons that we would want to kind of spread these out over as wide a range as possible. Okay. Um, so from that, we've got our A, we've got our B, we're trying to find X, but we can't find it perfectly, but we can find an X hat. And we already know the solution to the normal equation. There's the normal equation we just talked about. Um, we've talked about how A transpose A is um, invertible when the columns of A are linearly independent, and in this case they are. That's why A is full rank. Remember, we required A to be full rank, that means A transpose A is invertible, and so we can find this solution. So there's our solution, 5 and negative 3. So 5 is the intercept, and negative 3 is the slope. So we would go up here, and we would say our model is now Y is equal to 5 minus 3T. Now, scientists do this all the time. They take some observations, maybe over a limited range, uh, and then they get this linear model or some other model, and then they use it to kind of extrapolate. So, you know, you know we saw that doubling the rate of this chemical um, uh, will, will cause this type of linear relationship. 
Uh, and now we can use that to kind of um, predict what ha would happen if we quadrupled that um, amount of, of chemical in, in, in our, um, you know, in some medicine or some experiment or something like that. Um, and so this becomes a predictive model. So we took some measurements, we used it to estimate what our model should look like, and once we have estimated what our model looks like, we can use that to guess what will happen with future observations. Um, so there's our best line for three points. Uh, and engineers do that too. Let me back up. Engineers would try to do that same kind of thing too. They would, you know, suppose you're working for NASA and you're trying to figure out, you know, well, uh, you know, when, when the temperature goes down this low, the O-rings get this hard. When it goes down this low, the O-rings are this hard. Um, what if the temperature goes way down this low? How how hard will the O-rings get? Now, if you don't know why I'm talking about temperature and O-rings, um, do a Google search on uh, the reason for the very first uh, space shuttle explosion, um, and you'll see, you'll learn a little bit of history about how engineers should have been um, trying to understand the effect of temperature on O-rings um, and, uh, you know, what what the result of that was. So engineers can use these kinds of ideas to collect data, hypothesize a model, estimate the parameters of the model, and then use it to try to predict what will happen in scenarios that you've not yet observed. Um, so yes, there is some risk in doing that. Um, but the better that you are at being an engineer, the better you can do these things. Um, so that's another way that um, ECEs will use this. Um, you, know, you could use it as a computer engineer. You could say, well, I've built this system with this much cash. I've built it with this much cash, and I've built it with this much cash. I think it's a linear relationship. Please don't chastise me if it's not. I know nothing about cash systems. Um, and now, you know, my performance, I'm predicting or I'm modeling it as linear. And so now I should be able to, once I get my C and my D estimates, figure out um, uh, what my performance will be with an amount of cash that I've never even um, thought about or experimented with. And by the way, cash here is C-A-C-H-E. We're talking about cash memory, not money. Um, so <laughs> just in case you're wondering. Um, all right, so our projection view for here is, um, we don't spell it out for this example, but um, the reason that we're um, able to do this solution is that the, the, what we did was essentially project this B onto some projection P using this formula, um, and then effectively take all of this stuff, plug it into here with the known A that we have, and solve this for x hat. And my claim is that this x hat um, solves that from the projection viewpoint. So here's the two views of fitting a line. This is your old way of thinking it. Uh, thinking of it that you learned in your physics class or your statistics class. Nothing wrong with this. It's just one way to view it. And to be a good engineer, the more ways you can view a problem, the better off you'll be. So here's one way to view it. We've got our t-axis. We've got our measurement um, axis here. Um, we're taking some measurements. Boy, those errors were really bad. Uh, and we're trying to fit the best line to that. Obviously, the, the three X's, there is no straight line that goes through. And we're trying to find the line that minimizes the sum of the squares of the vertical error distances. That's one view. Our new view is over here. Um, we've got a column space. So here's our matrix A. We're in three-dimensional space. So we've got one vector A1. We've got another vector A2. Two vectors in three-dimensional space that uh, gives us a column space that's some plane embedded in R3 um, where the origin is um, included. So the origin here, 0, 0, 0, is in this plane. 
Uh, and so then we have some vector b, which is here, and that lies outside of the plane. And our goal uh, to solve the problem is to project it back into the plane. So here's the point in the plane. That projection, as we said, the error will be orthogonal to, uh, um, to the plane. So our projection here is p. The error is orthogonal to p. So that e vector, even though it's a little hard to tell on the page, is sticking straight out of the column space plane. Um, we know how to find this p. And then from that, we can actually solve this. We would solve for these. Uh, and we could then, you know, as we did with uh, A transpose A inverse times A times B. Um, so just this, just this part of it gives us the um, X hat. That gives us the 5 minus 3, which times A actually gives us the, the P vector. Um, so that solves that solution. So this is the way. The right-hand side is what we're going to be thinking about as we go through this. But don't ever lose sight of the fact that it does tie back to this kind of fitting a line viewpoint. If you can keep those both ideas in your head at the same time, you're going to be um, off to a good start. So minimizing the error. So from the fitting a line point of view, we said we wanted to minimize the sum of the squares of those vertical error distances. Well, what we want to do now, we've got B is the actual observed B. We've got AX. We know A. We're trying to find the X that will make this error small. Small. In what sense? Well, in the norm sense, we'd like the length of that error vector to be as small as possible. So um, that's what's going to be driving this. And we can actually prove that this is the solution uh, that's, that minimizes the, the length of this error vector. We can prove that f three different ways. Using geometry, now not you know like your 10th grade geometry or high school geometry where you were trying to prove that two parallel lines never intersect, um, but more of the kind of geometry we've been talking about with planes and um, perpendicular vectors and things like that. Or we can do it purely algebraically, or we can apply calculus. Um, we're trying to minimize something, so it makes sense that calculus might come into the picture because uh, you learned in your calculus class that maximizing a function you, you can do with calculus, minimizing a function you can do with calculus. So let's look at the geometry point of, v, uh, point of view. So here's our vector b, which lies outside of this space spanned by A1 and A2. So the, the, the blue rectangle uh, is evoking the idea of the column space spanned by A1 and A2. Uh, and we project B down into that space to give us P. And the error vector is there. Um, and that error vector will be, when, when the error vector is orthogonal to the column space, um, will give us the best choice. So that projection. So the projection ends up being this, which we talked about in the last set of notes. Um, so we know how to find P. And now I, I claim once we have P, we can easily solve for the X hat. Remember, the X hat is just the, the, the numbers that it holds the numbers that we multiply times these two vectors to build P. Uh, so we can easily solve that. And my claim is it's solved by what we're claiming is the least square solution. Um, and so let's test that. We're not prove, we're not deriving this, but we're hypothesizing it and then testing it. So let's plug each of these things in. Let's plug that form for x hat in. Let's plug this form for p in. And when we do that, we get something that looks like this. And so if we take the stuff on the right hand side, we notice that everything here is all of the red stuff here. And then we have an A out in front and we have an A out in front. So yes, it solves it. So there's our view from the geometry point of view. 
Let's look at it from the algebra point of view. And there is a little bit of geometric aspect to this, but it's more just manipulating things, you know, algebraically, linear algebraically. So we still want to do the same thing, make the error as small as possible. Um, and so what we're going to do is take our b. We can always split any vector into some parts. And the clever thing is what parts? Well, we want to split b into something that lies in the column space. Uh, and so that'll be the projection of b into the column space. And then the part that's perpendicular um, to the column space, and that is in the null space of A transpose, and that is our error vector. Um, so we're going to take our B here, we're going to split it into a P part that's in the column space, and an E part that is orthogonal to the column space. And we know that since it's orthogonal to the column space, that means it's in the null space of A transpose. We know that AX equal to B has no solution. In other words, there's no way that we can use the columns of A, which all lie in this plane, to build something that lies outside of that plane. But now P lies in that plane, so it's easy to find things that will, um, we can build P from the columns of A easy enough. And that's what it means to solve this problem. Um, so we've drawn in a few other things here. Um, we've got our B, we've got our P, we've got our E, um, we've got our um, AX. I mean, technically this should be AX hat. I didn't really put that there. Um, so this should be AX hat and this should be AX hat. Um, and so what we can do is uh, you know, this, this point, uh, this line here is, well, actually, I, I, I take that back. Uh, we don't want hat, hats there. This is just for some arbitrary x. So I can build this vector. Um, and so the error between x and b would be this vector. Uh, and the error between x and p would be this vector. And so clearly... Um, we can pick a value of x that will make this vector go to zero and make the tip of this fall right at the end of p. So this is solvable. That, that's what I wanted to show there. So I, I didn't really want the hats there. So ax hat would be the value of x that makes ax fall right on p. Uh, and that makes this, this error here um, between B and the solution uh, equal that smallest E. So we can do this algebraically. We can say, well, I'm going to split B into a sum of two things, P and E, that are orthogonal to each other. Um, and then their norms split. So that is a result of adding taking the norm of the sum of two things that are orthogonal to each other. <clears throat> and ultimately, we can see that to make this as small as possible, we want to make this equal to zero. And to make that equal to zero, we need to solve that problem. So again, we end up with a solution that looks like that. And then finally, by calculus. So just, show, just trying to illustrate that there's a lot of different ways to solve this problem. Not that you know, necessarily you need to be able to do all these. Again, I'm striving for you to learn, not just focus on what do I need to do for the exam? What do I need to do for the exam? Um, so just strive to learn this, and uh, I, I promise you, if, if, if you learn the ideas, the exams will take care of themselves. So we end up, when we talk about the sum of the squares, that was how we ended up, the sum of the squares of the errors. We described this from our, our fitting a line viewpoint. Um, when we do that, we end up with a quadratic function. And here we're showing two variables. Uh, in reality, it would be 
plotted in, in higher number of variables, but we can't really draw that. Um, so we end up getting some sort of quadratic bowl. So if we were to think about the equivalent of this in, in one variable, we would have, you know, quadratic function that would look like that. Um, this is just the, the uh, a three-dimensional version of that, or a two-dimensional version, depending on um, how you want to describe it. So, um, you know, here we're showing three variables that we're looking at, E1, E2, and E3. This picture would just be for the case of just E1 and E2. So, nonetheless, that's the thing that we want to minimize. Um, and so, um, just like in Calc 1, when you had a single function, a single variable function, uh, like we just looked at, so if we wanted to try to find the minimum of that, we take the function's derivative, set it equal to zero. But we have only one variable, so we have one derivative to worry about. Um, for this thing, any direction, the derivative is going to be zero. So if we draw, uh, you know, if we kind of move in any direction, we want the tangent line to be um, flat. Or we could think of the tangent plane. The tangent plane should be flat so that any derivative would be um, a, a tangent line in some direction in that plane. So these are Calc 3 ideas. You may not have had Calc 3 yet, but the basic idea carries over. Again, I'm just trying to show you here uh, to illuminate the idea that we get to the same place um, three different ways. So what we really need, as you'll study in Calc 3, is partial derivatives. And um, uh, we would need the, the two partial derivatives in our case um, to, be, um, to be zero. So we need our partial derivative with respect to C and our partial derivative with respect to D. So this is the function we're trying to minimize. Here's, here it is written out for our case here. Um, and we see it's a function of C and D. So we have two variables that we're trying to minimize over. So I need to take the derivative with respect to C, imagining that D is fixed. So that's the partial derivative with respect to C. Then I need the derivative with respect to D, assuming that C is held constant or fixed. And that's the partial derivative with respect to D. And so we use these um, little smoother Ds um, to represent partial derivatives, whereas in regular derivatives you just use a regular D. So we want the partial derivative of E with respect to C to be equal to zero. We want the partial derivative of E with respect to D to be equal to zero. So we just come up here when we're doing this first partial. Um, we imagine that D is a constant. D is a constant. We just treat this as a function of C and we take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Um, then we imagine C is held fixed and we take the derivative with respect to D. And you can check that you get these two results and we've set them both equal to zero. So now we have two equations and two unknowns that we try to solve. And when we solve that, when we kind of simplify that system, we get something that looks like this. Um, and so that's a nice square system. Three, 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 five are the rows of that matrix. But Go back and take the A matrix, transpose it, multiply it times A, you'll see that you get 3, 3, 3, 5. So remarkably, from calculus, suddenly, bam, A transpose A comes out of this, and we get it. This is it. Pretty cool. And the thing on the other side, you can verify, turns out to be A transpose B. So what system are we solving? A transpose A times X is equal to A transpose B. Ha! Normal equations, same solution that we've had. So um, what we're doing is taking partial derivatives of the norm, in this case the norm squared, to get rid of that pesky square root. Because no minimizing norm squared is the same as minimizing the norm. Uh, so to get rid of that pesky square root is a good thing. We want to minimize the norm squared of our error um, the partial derivatives of that are zero precisely 
at x values that solve the normal equations. Remarkable. So let's summarize it. Um, three different ways that we looked at quickly to um, make the error as small as possible. The norm of the error as small as possible is what we mean. Um, we looked at geometry where we relied on the orthogonality of the error. We looked at algebra where we could split B into um, a column space part and a null space part um, and show how to minimize the error that way. Um, and it ended up talking about projections. And then calculus. We set a couple partial derivatives to zero and found out that it, the solution was the same. So in every case, we ended up with this as our solution. So again, I encourage you as you go through your different courses, try to make the connections between all the different things you're seeing. There are remarkable connections in there for you to see. Let's tie this all back to our big picture. It's on the cover of the textbook, so it has to be important. It's not always true, but for this book, it is true. The thing on the cover is the big picture. Now, we've already looked at this picture for the other problem, where we had ax equal to b with infinite many solutions. Remember, this is not our focus here, but I'm just tying this back so that you can see what we've already looked at. So for that problem, when we had a scenario where A was such that um, we had infinite number of solutions. So in other words, that shows up when we've got uh, a null space over here other than just the zero vector. So our null space has dimension n minus r. So as long as r is not equal to n, we're going to have some null space that's not a trivial null space over there. And so any x can be split into two parts. And we split it into one that was in the row space, one that was in the null space. And we saw that um, every time we did this, so this, this xr was our particular solution. And we could find anything that lay along this line here would take us to the same b. Um, and so the key to solving that problem was splitting over on this side, splitting an x between these two spaces. But that's not what we're doing here. That's what we did before, solving for infinite solutions, trying to find the total solution. Let's see what we're doing now. Well, now, since we have a full rank a, the null space degenerates to just the zero vector. So our null space is just the zero vector. That's because we've got independent columns. That's what we mean for a tall vector or a tall matrix. Independent columns means it's full rank. And what are we doing now? Instead of splitting x over here, well, there's nothing to split between. What we're doing is we're splitting b over here. We're splitting b between these two spaces. We've got the column space of a, and we've got the null space, not of a, but of a transpose. So this is the, the null space from the, from the row point of view, the row null space. So we take our b, any b, so here it is, and it's lying outside of the column space. And remember, uh, since we have a tall matrix, this column space lies strictly inside Rm. That's why there's part of it that is part of Rm that is not the column space. Uh, it, it is makes up the null space of, uh, of A transpose. So we take our B and we can project it. Here's our B. It's outside of the column space. If we project it down to P, we get the projection of B down onto P. And then we can also project it onto the null space of A transpose to get E, and so those are orthogonal um, projections, projections onto two orthogonal spaces that are orthogonal complements of each other, and so we know that those two vectors are orthogonal to each other, and there's one way of slicing up the B. This is exactly how we sliced it up in our algebra view of finding the solution. So this leads to that algebraic solution. But it also 
gives us insight to the um, geometric solution because we know that the error is going to lie over here and we know that this whole space is orthogonal to this. So the error will be orthogonal to the column space and so it leads to the geometric view. The only thing this does not lead to is the calculus view. Calculus view is out there on its own. So those are the big pictures. And notice that in these big pictures, we're really not talking about fitting a line. We're talking about solving an AX equal to B where there are no solutions, where A is tall and full rank and B lies outside the column space. That's a huge, huge swath of stuff in engineering and science. Huge swath of stuff. So let's just look at a couple cases and then we'll talk about how much bigger this idea is. Fitting a straight line. So we've talked about that already. Um, statisticians like to call this linear regression, although they really do use that term for more than just fitting a straight line. Here's our picture that we had before for our three-point example. And here's our matrix. Uh, when we fit a straight line, our one column will be all ones, and the other column will be the, the points along the horizontal axis where our data was measured. Uh, the B vector I don't show here. The B vector holds the actual measurements. So in this case, there would be three measurements, 6, 0, and 0. Uh, and we've already seen, discussed how this is the solution uh, to that, solve this, the, the so-called normal equations. And so if we take A transpose times A for this, we, we get this product, and if you carefully multiply those out, you'll get 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1, and there will be m of those added up, so you get the m. And then for this value, you'll get uh, a, one, a 1 over here times t1 plus a 1 times t2 plus a 1 times t3. Add all those up, and you get the sum of the t sub i's. You'll get the same thing over here. And then down here, you'll get t1 times t1 t2 times t2, t3 times t3, and add them all up. So you get the sum of the t squareds. Um, so that's how we get that equation, or the, this matrix. That's A transpose A. Now, if you remember, uh, you know, chances are you don't, but if you were to go back and look at the equations that you saw in high school or um, in your college physics uh, for experimental data, uh, experiments or in your probability and statistics class, um, you'll see these um, m's and sums of ti's and sum of ti squareds in the uh, results for fitting a straight line. So I've just repeated that there, so we have it there to look at. There's our a transpo transpose times b. Um, so the the ones times all of these added up give us the sum of the b i's. This uh, this row times this that gives us the, the time-weighted uh, B sub i's. And then um, our line has slope, and, well, uh, intercept and slope that solves this set of equations. Um, and uh, so then you can invert this. And so in your probability and statistics class, they probably gave you a formula that involved or that did the inverting of that. So, um, so that was just tying this back to some equations that you might have seen in the past, but it's no different than what we've been talking about. You are now armed with a general approach to this. You don't need those stinking simple formulas, special case formulas. You can do this for anything. I give you any A, X equal to B. I tell you, you know, so, do a least square solution of this. Doesn't matter where it came from, doesn't matter if it's fitting a line or whatever, you know how to do it. Um, there, you've got the general approach, and better than that, you know why the general approach works, and you know what it's really doing. It's projecting onto the column space and then finding the X that maps to that projection. Now, here's a nice 
uh, special case for this line fitting. Um, and this is this is not just for line fitting anymore. <laughs> just to uh, you know, kind of play off on uh, a phrase in, in, I think, a commercial somewhere. Um, a, if, if we can make our A have orthogonal columns, things become nice. And we're just illustrating it here for the line fitting case. But this is true in general for any scenario. And, and we'll be seeing soon um, uh, how we can split things up uh, if, if we end up with an A that is not orthogonal um, columns, how we could convert it into one with orthogonal columns. So um, for the special case for line fitting, uh, if, if we can pick our measurement times, T sub i, um, so that they add up to zero, it will result in the columns being orthogonal. So that's for the line fitting case. But um, in general, if, if we have some general system, uh, maybe we've designed our self-driving car's sensor system matrix A to have orthogonal columns, it will actually help us, uh, as we'll see. So um, here's just another example where um, we have three data points that we want to fit a line to, but we've made our time such that they add to zero. Um, if we look at that, there's our, our matrix version of that, um, and there's our normal equation. And if you look at this, um, you'll notice that it's diagonal. But remember that these off-diagonal elements, what were they? Let's back this up and take a look. If we back it up, look, they are the sum of the times. And we just said we're setting the problem up so that those are zero. And so this is diagonal. Um, and so this becomes very easy to solve, um, uh, both by hand, and it helps when we try to do it numerically as well. Uh, and we can see that basically this, this would come for any A transpose A if the um, columns of A are orthogonal to each other. Uh, these off-diagonal elements are really nothing more than just the inner product between uh, the two columns. And if A has more than two columns, um, we, uh, but they were all orthogonal to each other, all those off-diagonal elements would all become zeros. Um, and then it becomes very easy to solve the system. You don't even really have to do matrix inversion. So um, in practice, having these orthogonal columns, not just for line fitting, but for any least squares problem, having these orthogonal columns is so helpful that it's worth trying to convert your problem into a scenario that, that gives that. So I, I say moving the origin of our data um, only because here we're talking about centering around zero. And I put it in quotes because when we have a more general A, um, uh, it won't necessarily shake out as being moving some horizontal axis to be centered at, at the origin. Um, so anyway, that's that. Here's some, some more pictures for this particular problem. Um, we know that we've got a B that lies outside of our column space, um, and uh, we can find the projection of that um, and then look at the error vector. Uh, so without even going through the details of this, what do we know about these vectors? So um, we know that E and P are perpendicular to each other. Um, so this, this um, P that we computed here, and then if we were to take that P and subtract it from B um, to get the E vector, uh, what do we know about them? Well, we know that they're perpendicular. And how can we verify that? Well, um, we could take these things and do an inner product to verify that. But we know that this is true because E is going to lie in this left null space. P is going to lie in the column space. And these two spaces are orthogonal to each other. Fundamentally, always, that's how it works. So by keeping that in your mind, you don't have to work these tiny little details out. You got the big picture and you can bring it to bear. So we've been fitting straight lines. Can we fit other things? Can we say fit a parabola? 
because um, lots of times things can't be modeled as a straight line. Suppose we're tracking some sort of ballistic missile, um, and it, it maybe it doesn't have any uh, uh, you know engine that's driving it, so it's not a rocket. That's what makes it a ballistic missile. It's just it's been fired, and it's just following some trajectory um, set by its initial velocity uh, and position. Uh, and the uh, gravitational pull and uh, friction due to air and wind and so forth. But let's let's ignore all the air effects. Uh, let's suppose this is uh, you know outside of Earth's orb uh, atmosphere, so, or at least high enough up. So if we knew at some instant of time what its velocity was and what its position was, uh, and we knew that it was following a ballistic path due only to um, gravity, no other forces, we could actually predict where this thing was going to be. Um, but another way would be to take several measurements of this thing. Uh, so maybe we don't know what its velocity is, um, and we don't know its, its, uh, uh, its, well, we don't know its velocity, but maybe we know, and let's just think about you know, a one-dimensional world. We know its height at three different times, uh, and we've measured those. Can we fit a parabola to this to show us um, what parabolic path this ballistic missile would be following? Um, well, the first thing, I mean, right away, you should know three points, any three points, I can put a parabola perfectly through those. So this problem is a little funky. It's a degenerate problem, but let's work through it anyway and then see what ends up happening and we'll talk about it. Uh, so uh, we're going to find the height of this ballistic object, ballistic missile, uh, B1 through BM at times T1 through TM, and we're going to model it by this parabola, second order function. Um, there's our M equations. and you should be able to think about how to write this into a matrix form. Uh, so we've got our, our variables C, D, and E uh, multiplying into 1, T1, and T1 squared to give us B1. So we get something that looks like this. So notice that we've got, uh, we've got 1s here, we've got times here, we've got times squared here. So we've got 1s times and times squared. Um, and then what goes in the B vector are actual measurements. So you should be able to think about how you would extend this to trying to fit a third order polynomial or a fourth order polynomial or any order polynomial. As the order of the polynomial goes up, the number of columns will go up and each column will hold a higher order power of the time measurements. Um, so we set this problem up. Doesn't matter that it's fitting a second order polynomial. Once we get the A and the B, we can solve this regardless of where that A and B came from. And that's a big idea, what I just said. Doesn't matter where A comes from. Doesn't matter if it's fitting a second order polynomial. Once I've got the A and the B, and I've agreed that's the model that I'm trying to fit, the rest boils down to solving this. Now, I better make sure that my columns are linearly independent so that I have a full rank. And I better make sure that I've got lots of measurements, many more measurements than the number of things I'm trying to calculate. So I've got three that I'm trying to estimate here, C, D, and E. So, uh, you know, I'm going to want a lot of measurements. The more, the better, really. Um, but Regardless of how it's set up, regardless of how many measurements you have, this is how you solve it. Um, and so suppose um, these were the three heights that we measured at these three times. Um, so there's our equations, and we set this up. We get our A transpose A. We get our um, A transpose B. Notice that in this case, our A is not tall. It's square. And notice that the columns are actually linearly independent from each other. So this actually 
had a solution to begin with. Um, so we didn't really have to go through all the least square stuff. That's why I said this is a degenerate problem. Um, but let's work through it anyway. We get our x hat. Um, and the best quadratic function that fits is that. Um, so as I just said, notice that the original matrix A has three columns, three rows, and, and they're linearly independent, so they span the whole space of R3. Therefore, the projection is onto R3, so we're, we're projecting from R3 onto R3. Projection matrix is the identity matrix. And so what error would we get if we projected? Well, the error is actually zero. So you can actually show that when you plug in these t values, you can verify this. Plug in these t values to this equation, and you'll get um, 6, 0, 0. Um, so if we plug in t equal to 0, we get 6. If I plug in t equal to 1, I'll get 6 minus 9 plus 3. That's 0. And if I were to plug in 2, uh, well, I'd get 6 minus 18 uh, plus uh, 3 times what, 4, uh, 3 times 4, 12, uh, which would also work out to be 0. So I have 0 error? Yes, I do, because you give me any 3 points, I can draw a parabola through it. Just like you give me any 2 lines, I can draw a line through it. So really, for this problem to be meaningful, we need more than 3 measurements. So four measurements at the least. But as I said, the more measurements you have, the better the process is at uh, combating, not competing, combating against the noise. Um, well, competing against the noise, I think, works too. Uh, we are competing against the noise. So much of what electrical and computer engineering does is competing or combating against noise. So as you go through your future classes, um, keep that in mind. So some final comments on this, and this ties into what I just said about keeping all this in mind as you go through your future classes, but as you move on to become a great engineer. Um, least squares is everywhere. It's a key tool for engineers. And where does it show up? Well, it's not just for fitting polynomials. We can fit all sorts of models to our data. Um, so signal processing, the, the field that involves taking some time-varying voltage and extracting information from it or, you know, uh, cleaning up that signal so that you can hear it better or extracting, uh, you know, some sort of estimate from it. So, for example, radar. Um, how does radar work? I send some little pulse out. Uh, in fact, a whole bunch of little pulses uh, out through a radio antenna, through an antenna, electromagnetic signal goes out, propagates electromagnetically through the airwaves, goes out, hits a target, hits an airplane, propagates back as an electromagnetic wave. I receive it at another antenna. And from that signal that I've received, believe it or not, I can actually extract information about how far away is that target and how fast is it moving and at what angle is it from me. Um, that last one I can do if I have multiple receiving antennas. Um, but if I only have one, it's uh, kind of hard uh, to measure an angle. Um, so that's signal processing. Um, and the idea of least squares is in that radar processing or sonar processing or um, cleaning up some speech that's been recorded to make it more intelligible or trying to understand uh, you know, speech recognition. Um, all of that is in the field of signal processing and a lot of that stuff is based upon least squares. Control systems. How do I make an airplane or a self-driving car do what I want it to do? I need to be able to measure things about the system and then use that to control what the system does. A lot of that is based upon least squares. Um, communication systems. Um, a lot of the techniques that allow you to receive digital data regardless of where you are um, and the fact that you're receiving such a tiny 
a very weak signal from far away, but you can still accurately decipher the data that's been sent to you. A lot of that is based upon least squares. Uh, computer networks, um, how we do signaling within a, uh, you know, how we send data within a computer networks. A lot of that is based upon uh, least squares. Um, I, I've left a lot out. Those are just a few. Power systems, um, how you um, measure the quality of power systems. A lot of that is based upon least squares. And as an engineer, any experimental work that you do, um, you, you have a hypothesis of what a curve should look like. You take some data uh, and you want to try to fit a best uh, curve from whatever your theory says it should be. Try to fit that curve to your experimental data. And, you know, to just cover all the bases, etc., etc., etc. There's another phone call there. I'm going to ignore that and hope that someone will get it. Um, but etc., etc., etc. This is everywhere in all sorts of engineering, all sorts of electrical and computer engineering, and you now know how to do that. Um, and so I'll see you next time in the next video.